Once again, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to this Kadori Earth Program talk with Kate Raywards. My name is Ron de Meijer, and I'm the Executive Director of Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden. It's a holiday today in Hong Kong, the Chung Yung Festival, which is a special day of ancestor memorials. We had more than 300 people signing up, and quite a few people may listen to it later on as well. Very important too, it's World Animal Day today, an international day of action for animal rights and welfare. Before we start with the talk, I have to give you a few technicalities and housekeeping rules. One thing which is very important is that today we have simultaneous translation in Chinese, and to me more specifically into Putonghua in Cantonese. So our language default is the English channel, but if you like to follow the translation in Cantonese or Putonghua, please click to the channel below where you can see, you can choose Chinese or, and, and then you can choose between Putonghua or Cantonese. You may also use to mute the original audio by clicking the same language button if you only want to listen to the simultaneous translation voice. So that's an important technicality. And before we give it over to Kate, a few, a few remarks about this program. So at Kadori Farm in Botanic Garden, our mission is to harmonize the relationship between humans and environments. And we do this via our wildlife rescue center programs, nature restoration, low carbon living, and very important here, holistic education. And as part of our holistic education programs, we have established the Kadori Earth Program, which is an initiative from Kadori Farm and its collaborators. And we co-created uh, by using integrating various trends of KFBG's nature conservation, and it provides life transforming learning experiences. we we'll try to reconnect people with themselves, uh, uh, with each other, huh? and by reconnecting nature. Um, as part of this unfolding initiative, we have initiated, we have invited world renowned ecological speakers to share knowledge and inspiration that can help us shift towards a more ecological centered worldview. And through this series of online talks, we hope to rekindle our connection to the earth, all living beings in a time of increasing challenges. So we invite people to join us on this journey of care and reference for Mother Earth and one another. We have quite a few different range of speakers. We have more theoretical thinkers, who, and then we have people who put us more in practice. We started with celebration of the living earth by Satish Kumar. We had Stephen Harding talking about Gaia and the health of our planets. Rob Hopkins from Permaculture Transition. And today we have Kate Rayworth with Can Humanity Live Within the Donut? Just a few words as introduction for before we give over the microphone to Kate. So the donut, of course, if you can eat it, but also it's a compass for the 21st century development that meets the needs of all people within the means of a living planet. A planet where no one falls short of life essentials, from food and housing to healthcare and a political voice. So it's environmental, it's social, it is human, and it's nature. While ensuring that collectively we do not overshoot our pressure on life's earth supporting systems, on which we fundamentally depend in which ranges from a stable climate, fertile soils, and a protective ozone layer. And what Kate will talk about today is what it means in practice for diverse situations of the world nations and cities. Now, throughout the talk, um, you will have a chance to ask questions afterwards. And I would like to invite you to think and make notes of what these questions might be throughout the talk. And then you can make them later via the Q&A box. So best to ask the questions after the talk and focus on the talk itself. We also would like to encourage you to have your camera open if possible, at least during the start in the end of the talk so we can close it to an encounter with each other. Best to use the speakers option at view and the right hand type zoom to see the speaker in gallery view during the Q&A. As you may have noticed, please note that the webinar will be recorded and we will share this with, with a, a Kadori Farm audience later on and also help to spread this inspiration. If there's any technical problem, please chat to the message to the KFBT host. 
Finally, about the Q&A, like I said, you can ask the questions later on in the chat box. You can do it in Chinese as well. It will be then arrive in English version to me, and I will then ask an appropriate ones to Kate. I guess these are all my introductions. I think, Kate, are you ready? Over to you. Thank you so much, Wanda, and it's a real pleasure and honor to join you all today. I think this is indeed the first time I've connected with an audience predominantly in Hong Kong, so it's a real pleasure. And it's lovely to see so many faces suddenly appearing on the screen. Hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to the next 90 minutes conversation. So I'm going to share my screen. And yes, I'm going to talk about donuts, but the best donuts are not the kind you eat. The best ones for us are conceptual. It's the shape of the donut that really matters. I want to begin where I began, which is studying economics. I came to university in 1990. I went to university to study economics because I believed it would give me the mother tongue of public policy making. And I was very frustrated by what I was taught because I think the mindset that we are all taught, even if we don't study economics, we learn it, we hear it in the media, in parliament, in, in politics, that mindset shapes how we think about success and we need to transform it. So let me give you a quick overview. I think some core images of what I call 20th century economics, the old mindset we need to leave behind. The first image of this economic thinking that is taught worldwide is supply and demand of the market. When we begin economics like this, starting just with the market, it puts price at the center of our concern. That becomes the metric of economics. How much does it cost? And anything that falls outside of the price contract is called an externality. It's external to the price. This means that the ongoing destruction of the living world is called by economists as an externality. And to me, that is reason enough to transform our mindset. The second image I want to share is the selfie, the portrait of humanity at the center of mainstream economics. And it's a character known as rational economic man. I drew him. This is how he's described. He's a man. He has no children, no, no parents he's caring for. He stands alone, independent. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. The problem with this description of humanity is that the more that students learn about this character, the more they start to emulate him. They value self-interest and competition over altruism and collaboration. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we will become. The third picture is the shape of success, the goal. What is the goal of the economy? And in 20th century economics, it is growth. And it's endless growth, no matter how rich a nation already is. Economists and politicians will tell you that the success of the nation lies in yet more growth. I'm sitting in the UK. This has become a very, very loud narrative right now, even though this is one of the richest nations in the world. It's always more growth with no end. I believe these underlying concepts profoundly shaped the mindset that economists have inherited. And I think these ideas have led us into many of the challenges we face today, from financial meltdown in 2008 to the era of climate breakdown. This led to a protest crackdown against protesters protecting the planet, protecting community, crackdown on that, and COVID lockdown. And today we have crises in food, in energy, in housing, affordability on top. These crises, I think, emerge from systems that are based upon endless expansion. And if we are to get beyond responding again and again to crisis, we need a new vision of success. 
So this is where the donut comes in. And as Wanda said, you can think of it as a compass for human prosperity. So the goal is leave no one in the hole in the middle of the donut. That's a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life. People do not have their own food, water, health, education, income, social equity that everyone has a claim to. And these social dimensions in the middle come from the sustainable development goals. So all the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these essentials. Leave no one in the hole. But as we use Earth's resources and get everyone over the social foundation, we also start to put pressure on an ecological ceiling. And around the edge here are the nine life supporting systems of planet Earth, known as planetary boundaries by Earth system scientists. These are the life support systems that keep Earth alive and stable with a stable climate and fertile soil and abundant biodiversity and healthy oceans and a protective ozone layer overhead. So leave no one in the hole and don't overshoot Earth's limits. The space is the green donut space in between. And immediately we've transformed the shape of progress. It is not never ending growth, it's balance like this. And when I do it with my hands, it feels like a heartbeat. We know that health lies in balance in our own bodies. Can we learn from bodily health to planetary health? When I first drew this diagram 10 years ago, I was really surprised by how many people responded to it and found it empowering and a, a diagram they had always been missing. And I started to look, thinking about how other cultures than the Western economic mindset, how had other cultures represented well-being, thriving, balance for millennia? And of course they have in so many different ways from the yin yang to the medicine wheel, the Celtic double spiral, the Buddhist endless knot, the idea that wealth and health lies in balance, not endless growth, has been known by many cultures for millennia. I believe the Western economic mindset that has been exported worldwide now also needs to learn from these and recover a sense of balance. Because if balance is the goal, we are very far from that now, as all of the red in this picture shows. Billions of people are falling short on the essentials of life with the red going inside the donut. And we are already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries on the outside. So if I bring some newspaper headlines from around the world, these issues of breakdown of the living world are in the news all the time. And they impact on humanity every day. Around the world, food and energy shortages are fueling a global food crisis. The most shocking statistic I can show you here is that the richest 1% of people worldwide own half of the world's wealth. So we live in an incredibly unequal and ecologically damaging world. How do we turn this story around? I think this image is an image that tells us a picture of ourselves now, and we must respond to it. I believe that our children and their children will ask us, what did you do once that you knew this was the situation? How did you begin to turn around the story of the future? So every person, whatever roles we play in life, in the world, we can ask ourselves, how do I start to turn this story around? And I think it's important to remember that last century's economic theories, last century's government policies, last century's business models, and last century's lifestyles, none of them were designed to solve this problem. They were designed 
on the basis of endless growth. So we should not expect them to solve this. We need new theories, policies, business designs, and ways of living to turn this story around. I've just shown you the global story. Let me bring it down to the national story. Here are just four countries, very different across the world and their national donuts. So Malawi on a very low income per person has significant human shortfall. That's the red in the middle without overshooting its share of pressure on the planet. You have China, both shortfall and overshoot, Denmark, no social shortfall on this global comparison, but significant ecological overshoot. And then the United States, one of the richer countries in the world, as, as is Denmark, even has some social shortfall due to inequality in the country, but massive ecological overshoot. So this shows us that there is no country in the world that is both meeting the needs of its people and living within the means of the planet. Every nation must transform. Let me put that for you in the context of 50 countries. Now the sweet spot here is that top left hand corner. That's where we are meeting the needs of all people, but doing it within the means of the planet. And here you can see there's no country in that sweet spot. The nearest country is Costa Rica. For me, this diagram reminds us that no country should call itself a developed country because all of the high income countries that you see along the top with a lot of red overshoot, they are destroying the life support systems of planet Earth. There is nothing developed about that. Every country is on a journey towards the sweet spot. And these nations are interconnected through histories of colonialism. My country, the UK, being particularly uh, in, important dominant player in that. Through military power, through corporate power, trade and finance rules today, through resource extraction and the impacts of climate change. Every country's future depends upon every other. We are profoundly interconnected. What then do we do? How do we begin? If humanity is to turn this story around, I believe we need to transform two fundamental dynamics. We need economies that become distributive by design and regenerative by design. Let me tell you how. We've inherited linear degenerative economies. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, and then throw it away. And this take, make, use, lose is running down the life support systems of planet Earth. We must transform this linear degenerative economy into a circular or cyclical economy where resources are not used up, they are used again and again. This is an economy that works with and within the cycles of the living world. So in, Pictures, it's moving from landscape degradation to restoration, from throwing away our electronic waste in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people to repair and reuse and share and refurbish and recycling the circular economy. At the city scale, it's transforming a 10 lane car highway here in Korea, to a nature-centered district, bringing ecology and life back into the city. At the scale of a building as well, a nature-less hospital in the UK, not a living thing in sight, and a nature-rich hospital in Singapore. I know where I would rather be if I needed to get well again. So from degenerative to regenerative in how we design our living world. But also we've inherited economies that are divisive. They capture opportunity and value in the hands of a few. And we see the rise of a global 1% and a national 1% as a result. Instead, 
we need economies that are distributive by design, distributing opportunity and value to all who co-create it. And that turns out to be the whole of society. So a few examples moving from profit-driven business, business that extracts the maximum profit from workers through supply chains to purpose-driven business. Here is a company, the, the owner is holding up a sign that says the workers are my boss. And the women have a sign saying, I own my fashion factory. This is an employee owned company where the workers are paid above living wages, distributing the mm. value that mm. they could create. Mm. Also thinking about outsourcing public services in cities, often outsourcing goes to the lowest cost and again can be extractive. What about community wealth building where cities use their power of purchase to buy locally from distributive, regenerative local enterprises? A few other examples towards distributive cities. Public transport where the bicycle and the pedestrian come before the car. Cities that invite solar cooperatives, so locally owned solar energy systems that are creating low carbon social housing, as in Milan. And in Cleveland, Ohio, a cooperative creating green jobs. So creating good jobs to transform the city. This brings together distributive and regenerative by design. So I want to go from these ideas, these abstract ideas of the donut, regenerative and distributive, what could it look like to start trying to do this in a place? And so here we move to the practice. And almost as soon as I first drew the donut diagram 10 years ago, people started saying, can we do this in our city, in our nation, in our town, in our community? And so at Donut Economics Action Lab, we have created a methodology for downscaling and unrolling the donut where you live. So I invite everybody to listen to these examples through the lens of where you are based. What would it look like to do this where you are? So I'll ask around the question of a city, but you can think of a town or a state or a district or a neighborhood or indeed a nation. How can our city help bring humanity into the donut? Well, let's unroll it, open up that space, and then we can go inside between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling and turn this into a canvas for exploring possibilities locally. So we go inside that space and we ask this question, how can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Now that's a big question, I know. So we divide it into four lenses. We've got the local perspective of where we are and then our global impacts. So let's start the local social question. How can all the people of our city thrive? What does it mean to live well here, to have good schools and housing and transport and community and a decent income and social inclusion? That is defined by the people of a place and this, the answer will be different around the world. That's a local conversation. Then we add the local ecological question. How can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? So wherever you are right now, imagine going to the, the wildland next door, the nearest healthy natural habitat of your place. That will show you nature's genius for thriving where you are. Nature has learned to sequester carbon and store water after a storm. She houses biodiversity. She cools the air from the treetops to the forest floor. Can we create cities that aim to be as generous as nature is? How can we bring water and life back into the heart of our cities? How can our cities cool the air and sequester carbon and harvest solar energy and store groundwater? So these two lenses, these are the local ecological questions and the local social questions. 
and many cities only focus on these. But every city is connected to the whole world through global supply chains, through trade, through its impacts worldwide. And so we must also ask bigger questions. How can our city respect the health of the whole planet? Think just about the clothes that you're wearing today, the electronics that you're using, the food that you have in your fridge, the furnishings and construction materials that made your house. Where did they all come from? They come from outside of the city. They have been imported from the world and they have a global material footprint. And that is a big part of what pushes nations over those planetary boundaries, the big red overshoot. So how can we come back within by creating a circular economy, a far more material efficient economy and cut our global carbon emissions too? And the last question I'll add here, still thinking of the global supply chains for food and clothing and electronics, how do we respect the well-being of people worldwide? Who made the clothes we wear? Who picked and packed the food we eat? Who assembled our phones? These are workers in global supply chains. How can they be ensured a decent living? How does our city's lifestyle create climate change impacts and have impacts now on people around the world? The attention of the world has been in Pakistan, recently in Florida, in the US, in India, across Africa. How are people impacted today by the lives we lead? And we anticipate climate refugees in the future. How will they be welcomed here? These are just some of the questions that come up when we look at our city and place through these four lenses. So we began this work downscaling to the city back in 2019, before COVID. And we began in Portland, Philadelphia and Amsterdam. These photographs show city officials and community members working together to think through the implications for their city. And I want to share with you some examples from around the world. So Amsterdam was the first city to create a city portrait against these four lenses, as I have described. And they put it at the center of their vision for the city to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting the planetary boundaries. That is a totally transformative vision for the future of a city. How do we then turn it into practice? In Amsterdam, they put this concept at the heart of their policy to become a circular city, aiming to be 100% circular by 2050 and 50% circular by 2030. That is a rapid and major transformation. How do they begin this journey? They are working on creating circular social housing, refurbishing existing housing to make it affordable for all, a circular clothing chain, especially the fabric of denim, which is used a lot in Amsterdam, and connecting local farmers with the city, particularly during the COVID crisis. So these are a few examples of the city beginning through different sectors to bring circularity into its ways. Also in Amsterdam, a large group of civil society organizations got together and created the Amsterdam Donut Coalition to connect them using the ideas of donut economics to bring about transformations they are already pursuing. So they've used it as a playful, accessible idea to galvanize more momentum amongst city change makers. In Leeds in the UK, a city uh, community organization led the unrolling of the donut and they've created their own Leeds city donut that you can see here. So they've created their own metrics for monitoring how they will progress over time. Are we getting into the donut or still going out of it as a city? In Birmingham in the UK, there's a fantastic community-based organization called Civic Square. Their, their uh, web address is at the bottom. I really recommend looking at what they're doing. 
if you are interested in very community-based, neighborhood-based, street-to-street transformation, engaging everybody in conversations about the economy and what it means to transform it. I've just shared some examples from Europe, but this is happening around the world. We were honored to be asked by the government of Bhutan to run a workshop with them, exploring what it would mean for Bhutan to connect the idea of gross national happiness with donut economics and how this could help to shape future planning in the Timpu and Paro region of the country. In fact, there are many cities and places around the world, as you can see, using these ideas to bring about local transformation. Now, everywhere, policymakers come back to us and say, if we really want to bring about this transformation, we need to look at the design of our own institutions. And this is the last big idea I want to share with you today. Many city mayors and city councillors will say, we've inherited the mindset to ask, how can we make our city grow? This was the old metric of success, but that's not our vision. That's not our ambition. We want to make our city thrive. What is it that has some places still chasing growth as the goal and others can already move to thriving. And we believe it's five deep design traits of a place that make all the difference. Their purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. And I'll explain each of those briefly. So what is the purpose of your city? Imagine you are a city mayor and a council. What is the vision of the city that you want to become? Amsterdam, created this orange donut for their city. In Oslo, they have a really strong vision of rapid decarbonization. So having a clear vision of the place you want to become is very important and sharing that with the people of the place. Networks matter, the relationships, bringing key stakeholders together to create a new policy. In many countries and cities, people are engaging in deliberative democracy, city assemblies, conversations with the residents of a place about the future of that place, but also dissolving the power of opposing networks, vested interests that have for a long time in many countries had influence over politics and replacing those with the transformative relationships and networks that are needed. So what kind of relationships and networks need to be created to create a circular regenerative economy? Moving to governance, how can the place be governed for faster, bigger change? In Oslo, they are budgeting for carbon emissions cuts like they're budgeting for finance. So they're treating it as if it was a financial budget, but it's a carbon budget. And this is helping the city move very fast in its decarbonization. Copenhagen is a city that's using experimentation, trialing the possible future in one district. And if it works, expand it. So learning through experimental design. And some cities realize that if they can make a change at the city level, it will drive change at the national level. And this happened in Poland, a city demanding no longer to burn coal in the city created change at the national level too. So cities can punch above their weight in creating change. Let's go deeper, ownership. How can we make the most of public ownership of resources? Housing in Vienna is largely owned by the city. This makes it much more affordable social housing. Energy in Munich is publicly owned. They've made a much more rapid transition than many other places. Earth Pact means the land lease in Amsterdam. The land of the city is owned by the city. And this enables them to engage with the design of leases in a way they couldn't if it was all privately owned. And Copenhagen has moved fast in transforming its transport because of the public ownership of the transport services. So the ownership, who owns the sources of wealth creation here? 
I want to say also that the ownership of business really matters. Who owns the businesses in this place and how can they be required to bring about the transformations that are demanded too? Let's go lastly to finance that sits at the bottom because it's the most powerful driver underneath so much of this transformation. How can the city's finances be harnessed to bring about change? Whether it's the city budget cycle, whether it's through public procurement or through divesting, for example, city pensions from fossil fuel funds. Everything I'm sharing here are just examples of the possibilities what really matters are the five design traits and what they mean where you are. So we create this canvas and invite policymakers and communities in cities to ask, what of these five designs still draws us back to the extractive economy that is degenerative and divisive by design? And which of these are already drawing us forward to create a donut economy that is regenerative and distributive. And of course, we have to recognize that every city or community is based in a nation, in a region, in the world. So no city has all the control over everything, all the policies, the laws and regulations. It's embedded in much bigger systems, of course. So we can ask, with lots of post-it notes, what can we stop doing now because it's within the power of our city? What can we start doing now because it's within the power of our city? And what can we only do when we get together and work with others at the national, regional, or indeed global scale? And we've used this tool with policymakers and community members in cities from Canada to Malaysia, to the Netherlands, to Spain, starting to look at the deep design that must be transformed if we are to create regenerative and distributive futures. So let me pull back because we started a long way away with 20th century economics ideas. I believe these ideas no longer serve us. They are out of date. And I find it so frustrating to know that students are still being taught this mindset when they begin university, when they are studying economics at school. It will not serve the next generation to study this kind of economics. They need to be embedded in a mindset that recognizes the economy is embedded in the living world, that we are a social being as humanity, that the goal is not endless growth, but it may be regenerative, distributive design, that we need to create regenerative economies, distributive economies. And I've shared with you examples of the kinds of canvases that we're putting into practice with places. Lastly, I don't know where these green lines have come from on the screen. It's something very creative has happened here, but it wasn't, wasn't intentional. Let me pull back. I wrote a book, I wrote this book, Donut Economics, here it is. I wrote this book, Donut Economics, and it was published in 2017 because I wanted to transform the ideas in economic teaching. And as soon as I started presenting it, people started coming up to me and saying, I love the book, I want to put it into practice. I'm teaching this in my classroom, even though it's not on the curriculum. I'm taking this into my town council meeting. I'm sharing this in my company meeting. I'm talking about this with my community group. People wanted to put it into practice. They started sending me these photographs that you see of how they were already playing with the ideas. And many people are intimidated by economics, but nobody is afraid of donuts. So you can see people being playful, inventive, collaborative, the energy was so strong. It made me realize that the most useful thing I could next do was to set up an organization, Donut Economics Action Lab. It's an online platform. We invite anybody to join it as themselves, to become a member of this community. And here we share stories and tools that we've created. 
We put them in the commons. We share them openly. You don't have to pay to use these tools. Instead of asking for money, we ask for reciprocity. We ask that if you use our tools, you share back any innovations and you share back what you learned because this is how ideas will spread at the scale that these times demand. And this is how we together will create the knowledge and practices that we need for the 21st century. And the tools I described today about unrolling the donut and the four lenses are indeed tools available on our platform. You could use them as a city councillor. You could use them as a community member in your neighbourhood. We are soon going to be launching a tool specifically for businesses as well, because that has, requires a very specific focus that I'm happy to discuss if anybody wants to. So I invite you to visit our platform at donuteconomics.org. I really warmly invite you to become a member if you would like to, to explore the tools we use, to explore the stories of how other people have put them into practice. And please share back because this is how we learn and this is how we transform the future. I'll stop sharing now and I very much enjoy this becoming a conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. This is really inspirational. I mean, when you started with all this crisis, sometimes it's getting difficult sometimes to see the opportunity, but within 35 minutes, you show all the opportunities and you show the opportunities the options which we have as human beings, but also as, as organizations. Before I start asking you a few questions, please to the audience, ask your question in the chat box and I can convey them to, to Kate. Yes, so the chat box is there. I will make a selection of the questions you can save, of you can send. So please go ahead and ask any question you may have. Let me kick off then specifically, or thank you also for showing the inspirational examples of my native city, Amsterdam. And maybe think about Amsterdam in the place where most of our audience is coming from, Hong Kong. So if you think about, it, of course, you, you've, you've advised and inspired many cities. And we would like, as Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden, inspire the, the city of Hong Kong and the people here, but also the institutions to adopt your donut. What would be the first steps? What would we need to do, apart from listening to your webinar first? Well, there are different ways that places get started doing this, and it, it really depends on who is initiating it. One thing that's happened in many places is uh, community members have got together and created a, a, a donut network. For example, the Amsterdam Donut Coalition that I showed. There are around 20 such networks around the world, one in Mexico City, one in... Um, El Monte in Chile, uh, popping up around the world. So people just get together. Who else is interested in these ideas? Let's create a network and start sharing and learning together. And that's a community-led initiative. Another way that it's begun is by city policymakers, like city councillors or the mayor have contacted us and said, we see what's happening in Amsterdam or Copenhagen or Barcelona or Brussels, and we want to begin this here too. So if, it, if it's a, a local government led initiative, we connect them with other local governments to say, you can learn from each other how this is being put into practice. So for example, this recently began in Ipo in Malaysia. The mayor and the city council were interested in exploring donut economics. So we ran a workshop together with them to say what would it mean for Ipo to aim to live in the donut? And that's the first city in Asia, I would say, that has really taken on that ambition to live in the donut. So you can get started by seeing how others have got started, either as a community group or if it's led by um, a, a member of the local government. One thing I'll say from our side at Donut Economics Action Lab, it's very important for us. It's a principle that we've never tried to push anything to happen. I've never once tried to convince anybody, persuade anybody uh, to use the concept because it, it's really important that people are the best judge of the ideas that will serve them in their own context, in their own reality. So everywhere that it's happening, that you saw on the map, 
that's because people in that place decided that these ideas will serve us in the transformation that we want to bring about. They will be um, additional tool to us getting there. So we connect with them and ask, how can we best help you? I would also say, join the platform, see who else in Hong Kong is already a member of the platform. And if you, if you do create a group, reach out to us through the contact form on our platform, and you'd be put in touch with the member of our team who works with all these local groups. And I hope you would be very inspired by what's happening in other places. Thank you. Uh, let me go to the questions here before I ask. I've got quite a few myself, but let me ask first from the audience. I've got here from Virginia Morris, who would like to hear more about the business resources and development. So that especially we talked a lot about institutions, about people. What can businesses do? Business work to a certain extent trapped actually in the current growth model. Right. So the word, the area of business is, is an area that there's also always been quite a lot of interest of how can businesses connect with the donut. And from our point of view, it's also been very important to make sure that the idea of donut economics doesn't get greenwashed by business. We can all think of big companies that would love to say they're aiming to do the donut, but actually are not transforming at all. That are still very fossil fuel intensive, resource intensive and profit extracting um, underpaying workers. So it's really important for us that it doesn't get greenwashed by the world of business. As I said, we'll be releasing a tool in November, but let me give you a quick taster of the tool. When companies engage with the donut, they, we ask them first, well, let me, let me pull out the donut here. This will make it easier. We, two things, so one, think of a company that you know or work for we would say how does your company have an impact on humanity's ability to live in the donut there may be things that the company is already doing to help this maybe you're creating good jobs providing health care uh, enabling <coughs> people to have access to energy or producing food so the company may be doing positive things it also may be a very ambitious company that's a low carbon company, a renewable energy company. So it's helping come back within planetary boundaries. But you also have to ask, how is the current actions and operations of the company pushing humanity out of the donut? Let's be honest, many, <clears throat> many businesses actually profit at the moment by pushing people out of this space, underpaying workers and overshooting planetary boundaries. So we start by looking at the company's impacts on the donut, but then we very quickly move, and this will look familiar, we very quickly move to the deep design of enterprise because we believe this is really where the treasure lies. This is where the answers come. How a company is deeply designed will determine whether or not it can be part of a donut economy. So running through these quickly, what is the purpose of your company? Why does it even exist? What is it in service of in the world? How is your company connecting to its employees? Does it pay everyone above a living wage? Does it respect workers' rights? How does it connect to its suppliers? Does it pay well down global supply chains? How does it connect to its customers? How is the company governed? <clears throat> Who has voice in decision-making? We're seeing the rise of employee-owned companies and steward owned companies where nature has a voice on the board. Just last week, Patagonia handed over ownership of the company to nature, gave nature the 98% of the company's shares. So how the company is owned is key. Is it owned by the state, by venture capital, by shareholders, by family? Is it owned by the employees? Is it owned by nature? The design of the ownership of the company takes us down again to the most profound design trait, which is finance. Where does the finance powering this company come from? Is it through sales? Is it equity? Is it uh, loans? Is it venture capital? Where does that finance come from? And what is the finance demanding and expecting in terms of the return that it wants to extract? how much of the profits that this company generates 
are extracted for the owners and how much are actually reinvested in its purpose. So when we talk with businesses, this is where we always end up. The deep design of business and enterprise is the determinant, we believe, of whether or not a business can become regenerative by design, can become distributive by design, or whether through its existing design, it's locked into short-term profit maximizing, which ends up being extractive and degenerative and divisive. So a huge question. I hope that gives a, a quick overview. I think it's a really interesting and important space of work. And we believe that the, the kinds of company designs that the future needs are only just beginning to be created. We can't reinvent business. We inherited a very narrow model from the 20th century that said the owners, you should maximize financial returns to the owners through shareholder owned companies. That is just one model and it rarely serves life on earth. We can redesign these five design traits and we think it's a very exciting journey to do that. Thank you again. When you explain this, it, it reminds me also a bit what the B Corporation does and, 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 and how they certificate companies who don't want to greenwash. But I think that can become a bit of a technical question. And while I was thinking about Esther Cho was asking, a very interesting question, which even you refer to Patagonia. Can you elaborate how nature can own a company? So when you say so, 98% of the shares goes to nature, what does it mean? So Patagonia have set up a stewardship model of their company. And it's just one example of the innovations yeah. that are happening. So they've split their shares. Uh, the, the vast majority of shares are held in a, a stewardship model in, in service to nature, in service to the living world. So the decision-making power rests there, asking is this company uh, investing and investing its profits in service to life? And then just the other 2% of shares are held uh, in a different trust towards the, the, the rest of the company. I invite you to have a look at how they've designed this. There are other companies doing similar things. So a company called Faith in Nature, have put nature on their board. Um, a company called Willycroft, which makes cheese, have said, we're imagining nature as our CEO. These are the beginnings of new designs about stewardship ownership rather, and so it's owned by a steward who has a mission <clears throat> that is locked in and should not and cannot be changed over time. But this takes us into really fascinating questions of how can we redesign the board the role of the board, the mission lock. And I invite you actually to connect with our um, business and enterprise lead, a man called Erinch Sahan, who's leading this work in exploring with companies, how can we pick up on these innovations and show that what we think is normal business design is just one way and a very narrow way. And so uh, Juliana just shared in the chat box how Patagonia did it. So you can have a, a link, have a look you. for a detailed link in the chat box as well. There are questions about, let, let's continue a bit with businesses before we go to, I would like to go to the personal perspective as well. I've got a question here and let me go to the chat box um, specifically from Margit Huber in Germany, who's asking how can we, and let me phrase it here particularly, um, how can we make sure that this now also becomes a curriculum at schools? Because nowadays we're still working according to the, the economic model, mostly in universities, et cetera. And then maybe a few enlightened schools like a Schumacher College or whatever have more the likes of the donor economy, but it's still not practice. So how can we make sure it becomes the, the standard or at least the starting curriculum at schools and institutions and universities? Well, this is a great question. And it's one very close to my heart because. I, as I began, I'm passionate about changing the mindset, the first ideas that are taught to this next generation. I have 13 year old twins, a girl and a boy, who I, I'm really thinking all the time, what are they being taught? What is the world that they are being taught to see? Because they, like many children <clears throat> that you know, will be the generation who leads the world towards 2050. 
and the ideas they're taught now will shape the future that we give ourselves the chance of creating. So, as with much of this work, it's begun through those who just get started, teachers who just started bringing these ideas in the classroom and just started teaching it. At Donut Economics Action Lab, we're just about to hire um, an education lead in our team. We're currently a team of nine people and we're about to hire somebody to work directly with those teachers to learn from how they are creating lesson plans so that we can share those back so they can spread to many, many more teachers. So we start by working with where the energy is, the teachers who just get going. We want to make it irresistible and so easy for a teacher to bring these ideas into their classroom. Now, it's a whole other step to get the ideas written into the curriculum. And I'm really pleased to say that the in the International Baccalaureate Com Curriculum, which is taught in many international schools around the world, they have actually put Donut Economics into the textbook. So it's now part of the curriculum and part of the textbook. And many teachers have said to me, this, this obviously takes us to a new level because it gives us permission to talk about these ideas in the classroom. It's already part of the book. But I think, of course, there's a long, long way to go. And it doesn't only show up in economics. I think it has a natural home in the world of geography. In fact, geography teachers are much more open to it because it's a much deeper transformation in economics, whether we begin with supply and demand or whether we begin with the vision of the donut. That takes you down totally different courses. And so it's quite a deep challenge to economics teachers and professors to completely uh, transform the underlying ideas of what they've been teaching. I'll add one more thing here, which is that I've been teaching master's degree students at the University of Oxford for 10 years. They're coming from all over the world to do a one year master's. And as part of it, they, they are taught some economics, not by me, by another department in the university. 10 years ago, they expected to learn that quite mainstream economics. And they, I think they thought the ideas of donut economics were quite radical. I'm seeing even within this 10 years, the, the next generation of young graduates coming through are hungry for, ready for, expecting more transformative ideas. And they're much more likely to question if they're taught the mainstream mindset. So I'm sensing it. Of course, it's not happening at the scale and speed that's required, but we need to get these ideas accessible, playful, irresistible, and then get them into the curriculum. And if there are any teachers in this call who are using the ideas, please, please join our community, share what you're doing, share back, because that is how we make these things spread. Again, thank you very much. Let me go back to the questions which I'm having here. A bit about China, if we can. I mean, you, you said you're working all over the world. I didn't see any dot in China yet. I think K, um, Max from Quantum China asks, is there, are you, do you already have any active members in China? And do you see, do you see some developments there? I'm sure there are, some, sorry, I'm sure there are some active members in uh, of the platform in China. Um, I, haven't act, I haven't actually looked, but I, I will bet you there <clears> are. Uh, we haven't yet engaged directly with uh, any, Am I saying this correctly? I don't believe we've yet got connections with any particular cities or districts in China. I don't believe that my, my colleague Leonora leads our connection with local governments, but it would be wonderful to see uh, an initiative in, from a community led perspective or from a city led perspective, if this is of interest. So, and I, I do think that the ideas of donut economics speak to what I understand are the fundamental ideas of ecological civilization. So I think there's a, a strong possibility of a crossover connection there. But no, I don't think there are initiatives in China. If these ideas are compelling, please go ahead and create the first. Well, and hopefully this, and, and certainly this talk will help. So people get inspired here. We've got a predominantly a Chinese audience or so that will really help um, in maybe driving this in China too. I've got several questions about youth and personal donors. 
mm. without mentioning all the names because of different questions. How can you teach youth? We talked about a curriculum, we talked about IB. How can we make it perhaps more, I don't know, easier or is there a way to make it easier that, that youth will more easily understand or accept this? Even though we all know the crisis and we know the, the problems we have in the current economic model, the majority of people still prefer to use and then uh, buy use in, in, in basically the, the linear model or intro away, right? I mean, that's still the, the common model. How can we make sure that your inspirational model becomes a common way for people to act actually? And then I'm going back to the personal thing later. So how can we inspire use easier or even more than we do now? Well, when we introduce these ideas, actually, it's often young people who get get it much more quickly. Maybe because they haven't already been taught a different mindset. They often understand the ideas very intuitively. The organization Civic Square that I showed in Birmingham, they work with kids in the neighborhood and they say the kids just understand it very quickly and they connect it to local processes of food composting and growing. So I think there's an understanding there. My own experience raising children is my children understand it, but then they step out of the front door and they see the world created by adults and they're told adults, adults know best, adults are responsible. And yet they see a world absolutely degenerative of the living world. I remember my son, when he was about six years old, we were walking down the road once and he said, he said, mommy, why do most people not care about carbon dioxide? And I was so shocked by his question. And then I realized I had explained to him why we don't fly on holidays and the importance of cutting our carbon emissions. And then he looks at the world and it's full of carbon pollution and he, he couldn't make sense of it. So I don't expect young people to be the, the perfect models when they are raised into a world that is absolutely degenerative and has clearly disregarded all of these insights from adults. So I'm really, I really strongly don't want to say, you know, it's up to the next generation. No, there's a lot of responsibility on us, the current generation. I'm 51 years old. Many policymakers around the world are around my age. We are the generation now with responsibility to change laws in government to change the design of business, to change expectations in financial markets, to change lifestyles and what we think is a good enough life. So I think young people actually understand it quite intuitively. I think it's also important not to, I'm going to go sort of, is it about personal action or systemic change? And of course it's about both. There are things that each one of us can do. We can change how we eat whether we eat a lot of meat or we reduce that or we go vegan, we can change how we travel. Do you have a car or do you actually use public transport or a bicycle? And of course, where you live shapes your opportunity for that. How do you heat your home? How do you buy electricity? Do you buy from a fossil fuel provider or a green energy and renewable energy provider? Where, Which bank do you save your money with? Is it a bank that doesn't care about the living world or that actually takes responsibility. There are things that each one of us can do, but I don't believe that it's on the responsibility of every person to make the transformation this way. We need systemic change. We need cities and nations to transform the public transport system so it works, to provide clean energy, to create taxes and subsidies that tip us from fossil fuels to renewables that incentivize people not just to buy an electric car because we cannot make the transformation if everybody goes out and buys an electric car but move to either car sharing or cycling or public transport so more transformative options are only possible at the systemic scale and that's why we need both personal action and system-wide change Several people actually signed up during this webinar. So I think that uh, we make great. a short note. I already saw four or five people who signed up while, while you were speaking. So yeah, maybe we have a small change here as well. So I think that has, and actually also quite a few people in, in, China, in mainland China. So I think that really helps. 
Um, That's wonderful. If I could just say on that point, do go and look at our link to open groups and networks. There's guidance on if people want to create a group. There's guidance on the the principles for creating a group, what those groups can do, and how to set up. Do get in touch with my colleague through our contact form. He's called Rob Shorter. He would love to meet with you and help you if you do want to indeed connect and and start something. I think it's a great sales talk without selling anything. So that's all good, guys. Not selling Thank anything. <laughs> Just helping everyone. Um, as the phone was asking, even though you we, you give all the right examples for children, but yet, and I think you you mentioned you have twins of 13. Uh, my sons are about 10 years older, and they are sometimes quite skeptical about the whole thing. They are vegans. They try to change. But nevertheless, it's quite difficult for, for I think, for young people who see every, what's happening, everything around them not to become disillusioned. Now, maybe it's a repeat of the question earlier, but still, how can we make sure that children who see the change want to change themselves, but are getting disillusioned by everything that's happening around them, when nine out of 10 kids don't really care at the moment still yet? So what's your, how do you convince your 13 year old twins and other people, kids, how not to get disillusioned? Well, and that's a good point. So as you just said, some, some young people are not interested don't care, um, uh, maybe just disengage from it. And others are profoundly motivated and may also find it overwhelming. And I do ask myself, what, it, what must it be like to be a young person growing up in the world where on the, on the radio every day and the news headlines every day are telling us about the lock-in towards global heating that we are causing and the crises that are already locked in coming back to us. What is the psychology of growing up with that? It's not a surprise that many young people find themselves driven into climate anxiety and not only young people, right? Many, many people who've, who are motivated to come to this call, I'm sure some also feel a huge anxiety. What research does show that I've seen is that people who are in action are find it much better to be able to manage this, to not sit with an anxiety, but to be in action, to connect with others, to join with others, to, to feel that you are contributing and doing something about it. Certainly my own 13-year-old daughter, she loves to be in the environment club at school. She wants to go on a climate change march. She's engaging, and that's her way of dealing with the dissonance of growing up in a world where ecological breakdown is in the headlines every day, but you step into the high street and nobody seems to be taking any notice. So I think it's a question for every one of us. How do we keep ourselves engaged and motivated? And sometimes people say to me, oh, I, you know, I love your optimism. And I say, but I, I'm not optimistic. I never said I'm an optimist. In fact, don't be an optimist if that makes you say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. People are ingenious. We're, we're innovative. We will solve this. We've solved problems before. Relax. No, don't be an optimist if it makes you relax because we will not solve it that way. But also, don't be a pessimist if that makes you give up. If it makes you say it's too late and we are too many and it's too hard and the challenges are too great. Because if we take that attitude and then we sit back and give up, well, yeah, it, it will happen. It will be too late and, and nothing will change. So don't be an optimist if it makes you relax, but don't be a pessimist if it makes you give up. I say be, be in action in whatever spheres of influence you have in the world. If you are a parent at the school gates, <clears throat> how can you connect with other parents around the changes that you can make? We know that in our, in our neighborhoods, in our streets, if you, we, we gave up owning a car a couple of years ago. We now just use a car club and use one, rent one when we need it. This has a ripple effect on other people in the street. Oh, I, I, I see your car's gone. How are you getting around? Oh, you use the car club. Does it actually work? Yes, it actually works. We can influence other people by changing the way we live. So be in action. If you're a CEO, what can you do to change the design of your business? If you're a parent, what can you do? If you're a community organizer, a town councillor, if you're running 
a, a beautiful organization, a ecological organization in, in Hong Kong. What can you do? You host conversations like this. Each one of us can lean in and bring action in the spheres of influence that we have. What recognizing that we, we are in crises and I think the crisis isn't going to go away. So certainly in the UK people, you know, post COVID as if we're going to go back to some normality. I don't think there's a normality that we're going back to. I think we are going to be in what some people call the turbulent twenties, a series of interconnected global crises that will make food and water and energy and climate security <clears throat> recurring challenges around the world. So we need to take care of ourselves to be engaged, to, to be able to remain engaged in this context. I recently read actually that if you are a scientist, it's very difficult not to be a pessimist, but if you're a human being and you care about your family and your nature, you need to be an optimist. You've got no choice. Otherwise nothing will change. So I think that's the relation between that. I've got a question here from Katie Wong, who's actually going back from the personal back to the bigger picture. Mm. Can you <clears throat> share a bit more about the climate budgeting case of Oslo? I mean, I mean now we're talking about going more to specific questions. Okay, and, and I would advise you to, to, again, it would be wonderful if somebody could find out, uh, find a link to Oslo's climate budgeting. But what I understand is that the city of Oslo set themselves a more ambitious carbon reduction target than most other European cities that you could compare them to. And one of the ways they've actually been trying to hold themselves on track on that is by saying, just like every year, we, we have a financial budget for city departments for the transport and education and housing. Uh, these different departments get a financial budget. We're also going to give them a carbon emissions budget, which is going down. Right. So it's going to decrease. So the, the transport department, your budget is now down 20 percent this year and it's going to go down another 20 percent next year, really tying it tightly and um, recording the metrics and accounting for and reporting on those metrics every year. This has apparently been one way that they have held a very high, strong ambition. So it's creating new governance mechanisms like that, that help us tackle challenges on the speed and scale that's required. I, I just add in there something different, which is in the city of Amsterdam, you know, they announced like, like many cities have, Amsterdam said by 2030, there will be no fossil fuel vehicles in this city. So no cars, no trucks, no boats, fossil fuel free vehicles transport by 2030. Now, I think they said that in about 2020. That doesn't cost you money in 2020 to make that commitment for 2030. It immediately, though, sends a long, loud and a legal message to everybody living in the city, doing business in the city. Within a decade, you need to transform your transport away from fossil fuels. And so it sets in motion so many investment and divestment decisions and innovations so that by the time it comes, you can be ready for it. And I think things like that, just making <clears throat> that very clear, ambitious commitment, very loud, very legal and very clear to everybody, sets in motion so many decisions that need to happen. Which brings me to a question and also about science uh, asked by Dr. Gary Yates earlier in the in, in the question but chat box. He said, is there, and maybe this example of Amsterdam is, is an example, is there something like a tipping point that we can see actually that cities or economies or institutions see now that really we need to change and there's a tipping point in how might it look like? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, there was a, a conference on tipping points um, held in the UK just a couple of weeks ago, looking at both climate and ecological tipping points, which is why the scientists may be pessimistic because they see many of these damaging tipping points already locked in. And then asking, can we create social tipping points? In fact, the scientists were saying the only way we can respond at the scale required to 
stop some of these damaging climate tipping points are if we create social tipping points in time. So how do we create social tipping points? I think it's a great, a, a, a powerful way of thinking about it. What is a social tipping point? When have they happened in the past? Um, and how do we create people's belief in change in the system of what's normal and what's no longer permissible? And I think of this around the circular economy and a fossil fuel free economy. I think some places have already gone through that tipping point. Again, I'm going to mention Oslo, they've banned fossil fuels and cars from the city center. And it, a lot of pressure against doing this, there's a lot of resistance from the old ways, but then when you transform, the new ways start coming through and people start innovating into this new created space. And that of course creates a tipping point. But around circular economy, for example, it's a system-wide change that's needed. No single company can be a circular company alone. It depends upon an ecosystem of enterprises that it's working with. So you need to build up those networks I was talking about, the new networks that actually believe this regulation is real, the prices are going to shift. So there's a price tipping point from fossil to renewable energy, for example. And, and a, a mindset tipping point of, are we really going to move to a circular economy? This is real. This isn't a game. This isn't a pretend. This is happening and we're not <coughs> going back the old ways. COVID showed us tipping points, right? I mean, society is suddenly learning to, to wear masks. In, in, in Europe, nobody had ever walked in the street wearing a mask before. This was a culturally alien and suddenly it became obligatory. In fact, you would be stopped by people if you didn't. So we can we can adapt. We are adaptable as species. We we and we want to belong with others. We want to fit in. So there are human traits that enable us to move towards this tipping. We just need to unlock the systems change to start bringing them about. Thanks again. We've got five more minutes for asking questions, and then we we close it off. So. I've seen more encouraging messages from coming out of Hong Kong. So Corinne Chen says, thanks Kate, I'm an architect in Hong Kong, practicing and promoting architecture as beneficial to environment and people. So basically what we see in Hong Kong increasingly is that architects are becoming part of, as we call it, this new ecological or eco-civilization. It also is a good reminder for us as Kadori Farm Botanic Gardens, the role we can play rather than just restoring nature and rescuing animals as a catalyst in the borough that changed towards a more nature-based uh, society. So if there's any more questions, I maybe let me reverse, uh, Kate. Any questions Actually, you would like to ask? Do you have a question for us? Well, not a Hong question, not, not a question, but I would love to pick up on this last point. Thank you to, to the architect for bringing this through because I think architecture is a very powerful discipline in which so many things come together. Right? Because architecture literally designs the spaces that we live in. And we find many architects are being drawn to the ideas of donut economics. We're contacted by architects. How can I bring these into my practice? Because I'm designing the spaces where people will live and work and play and how they travel and designing so much of how they can reduce their footprint in the world. And I'm choosing materials. How can architects use materials that sequester carbon dioxide rather than releasing it? How can they create buildings and settlements that bring nature back into the city? So it's actually a beautiful space in which to bring these ideas into reality at a very uh, local scale. And of course, we all want to experience the future that we're talking about. An architecture can make a building, a block, a small district, a place where we can go and really feel that this, this holds the possibilities of the future. It, it can be real. So it's a very um, a critical industry and a critical design practice. Uh, the, here's the last word I'll share. When I studied economics, so much of it was framed as laws, the laws of supply and demand, the laws of diminishing returns. These are not laws. These are, these are ideas in economics and they use the word law to make it sound immutable. I, a big turning point for me when I was writing Donut Economics was to think of economics not about laws, but about design, just as architects always think about design. 
And I think about the deep design, here we are, the deep design of places, but also the deep design of businesses. We need to look into the deep design of the institutions we've inherited and transform them from within, bottom up, so that they are purposed for the future. Uh, if, if I'm leaving one message here, it's this message, and I invite every one of us to think about the design of the institution that we are part of and how it can be changed so that we can contribute to a regenerative and distributive future. And I also just want to say it's such a pleasure connecting with you. It's, it's also lovely on the screen. I'm spotting some, some friends I've known from my Oxfam days, people I've known around the world. It's lovely to meet new friends here and old friends. And I hope through Donut Economics Action Lab, we can create community. And I, if these ideas seem useful in your place, I'd be so delighted if you take them and say, what does this mean to us here in Hong Kong or wherever you are? It's about bringing these ideas into the local context and that is how we learn together. I see both our, our Mandarin translators uh, giving the thumbs up, so that's really good. Uh, oh, now they disappear from screen again, but that's uh, really nice. So that you're inspiring people from all over the world. And what I'm seeing here is actually in the message box I mean, just a message for, from Louisa Noble is to say how much you're an inspiration, your ideas, but actually by listening to you now in this web webinar, it's even giving more inspiration than just losing to all your podcasts and reading your books in the past. So I think you've gave a very much, a very inspirational talk, Kate. Very much thank you, thank you for that. Could, could, I, yeah. could I end on that? Thank you, Louisa, for that comment. And, and, and I really appreciate that. But I have to say back that what I did was write some words on a page in a book. And I did, I brought together so many ideas of brilliant thinkers, and it was a joy to do that. It inspires me that people say, and we want to do this. And people show up in a webinar like this and take the much harder next step of saying, okay, how do we actually do this here in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the town hall, in the community? So thank you for showing up and for taking these ideas and saying, really let's put them into practice because I am blown away every day by what people are doing with these ideas around the world. So this is big teamwork and that's why the community at Donut Economics Action Lab matters so much and it re-inspires me to keep showing up and not to get caught in eco-anxiety or pessimism but wow there are some amazing people on the team of trying to make this work. I want to be on that team. I'm going to show up. So thank you. Thank you very much again from all of us here in Hong Kong, from mainland China and from the rest of the world. I think, yes, it is inspiring. I see a lot of uh, smiling faces. So apparently you bring in via the screen a lot of inspiration. And, and it's, it's really a wonderful, wonderful uh, way of ending here. And talk about inspiration. I think our next speaker, and I have to refer back to Natalie in a minute, who is organizing this. But our next speaker in the series, you can see here, talk about inspiration. It says, inspiring hope through action. So Kate, after you, you're being followed by Dr. Jane Goodall. I mean, it's um, also one of our most inspiring speakers, which we all have. So really, I think that's uh, that's how it goes. And then that will be on the 24th of October. And Kate will, uh, Jane will also talk from the UK and having another inspirational talk. You can register here, as you can see here, at the, at the QR code right down. And then last but not least, we're ending the year with a very special speaker, John Quano from Papua New Guinea, who is an elder and a messenger from, uh, as I said, Papua New Guinea. He's called Cooking the Message. John is a totally different type of speaker than everybody had be, that we ever had before. He will partly speak in his, uh, at least a greetings always in his, uh, his own language, which is uh, another inspiration to listen to. So audience, thank you very much. For all your uh, for for attending it, for your questions, for your inspiration, Kate. Once thank you again. We would love to thank invite you. you now. Finally, Hong Kong is opening in for foreign for foreigners and for tourists without any any restrictions. We would love to invite you, Kadori Farm Botanic Garden, staying in our beautiful premises here. And before we end, Natalie, back to you. Thank you again. So thank you very much, Kate and Wanda, and thank you everyone for your participation. So this is the end of today's talk, and we hope to see you in our future workshop and talk.
Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.